everybody. Today is the second lecture. So I just want to clarify one, one point that we are recording it and we will upload it in the YouTube very soon, one by one. So uh, the first lecture, once it is in the YouTube, I'll send you very soon, or I'll send you a link to all the participants and all the subsequent lecture also. As it is updated, we'll send you the links. Okay, so uh, Prishendu is up to you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. So let me just try to sort of start from where I uh, left uh, in, in the last lecture. So uh, let's begin with this quantum Hall effect. Uh, so this is certainly a phenomenon that we know right from the 80s. And this is one of the first example of, uh, uh, first example where effect of topology in uh, condensed matter physics was properly understood. So, um, let me try to, again, which this is something that we went into the last class, but I'm going to sort of give a little bit more details since this is supposed to be a course. So um, I'm going to consider a uh, electron gas, which is residing on a two-dimensional plane. So for now, let's just consider a single electron on a two-dimensional plane, and uh, there is a magnetic field perpendicular to it. So let me just go on to this. Uh, just one second. So uh, let me just go on to this. Okay. So suppose uh, I try to write down the Hamiltonian of this electron gas. So as we know that in the presence of a magnetic field, your momentum goes to P minus Ea, where A is the vector potential. And since I need a magnetic field which is perpendicular to the plane, what I need to do is to choose this vector potential. Uh, we're having components either in the x or the y direction, and I am choosing a gauge, and this is typically called the Landau gauge, where one of the components of the vector potential is zero, and the y component uh, is chosen to be positive, uh, is to be non-zero, which is b times x. Okay, so you can check that this gives you curl of a to be just b along z. Now, if this is the vector potential, okay, then what do I have? Uh, my so since my a x is zero, my pi x squared, the x component of the momentum is just p x squared, and the y component is p y minus this quantity. This is just a bit, uh, this is how the vector potential enters, okay? So put in a, uh, so this should be really Ea over C, but you could set C to one, that speed of light, you could set it to one if necessary, but this is roughly what you get, okay? Now, if you look at this Hamiltonian, what you see is that uh, there is translation invariance on y. And why is that? Because y as a coordinate never enters this Hamiltonian. Okay? It's only the uh, momentum py that enters the Hamiltonian. So by standard principles of quantum mechanics, we choose the wave function taking advantage of this translation invariance as uh, a plane wave in the y direction and some pi of x. And when you put this back, and I'm sure most of you have worked this out at some point or the other, you find that you come up with a Hamiltonian, the one-dimensional Hamiltonian, because now Ky has gone out, Y has gone out of the picture, which resembles a shifted harmonic oscillator potential, where the shift x naught, which is the shift to this coordinate x, is given by Ky times Lb squared. And LB is this uh, quantity which is proportional to 1 over square root of B. And that's the only length dimension that you can make out of E, H bar, C, and B. Okay. That's the typical length of the problem, uh, length uh, scale in the problem. So if you appropriately scale everything here, you get a x minus x naught. Um, whole square and therefore you know this thing is clearly a harmonic oscillator kind of potential and if you work this out you find that you know it's uh, this is Landau levels which is typical for harmonic where this is harmonic oscillator levels which are typically called Landau levels and the wave function phi x is uh, is just the wave function of a shifted harmonic oscillator potential okay now you see that in this energy, there is no ky dependence and therefore there is a degeneracy, okay? Because the wave function of course has ky and uh, there is this degeneracy. So how do we calculate this degeneracy? You see, we did this a bit in the last class, but let me just go over, uh, go through this once again. So you see that because 
So first of all, if your sample is infinite, then there are an infinite number of states because there are an infinite number of ky degrees of freedom. Uh, but that's not very really interesting. Now uh, we want to calculate that. Suppose uh, we have a sample which is um, which is you know which is a square a rectangular sample with dimension l x and l y in the x and the y direction. If that's my sample, how many uh, modes do I have in the first random? So to see this, we first note that uh, when I have a dimension l y in the y direction right here, then my k y must be two pi l y times n. That's a usual quantization condition on momentum, right? If you have a box, this is a typical particle in a box problem. And then my x naught, that is the shift in the harmonic oscillator uh, coordinate, uh, effective 1D harmonic oscillator coordinate, is 2 pi by L times L, that is just ky times this LB square. However, if my sample direction uh, dimension along x is uh, Lx, then this shift must be less than or equal to Lx. Okay, because uh, your coordinate center for your harmonic oscillator potential cannot really go outside the sample. So this tells us that the maximum shift is when x naught is equal to Lx, and that should give me n max. So n max times 2 pi over Ly, that's the maximum value of Ky, times Lb square must be equal to Lx, which tells you that n max must be area divided by this uh, typical uh, 2 pi LB squared, which is the typical uh, characteristic area that you get when you uh, when you consider the magnetic wave. Okay? So it's basically LB squared. Okay? Uh, so this also tells you, because 1 over LB squared is proportional to B, it also tells you that the number of such states increases as you increase the magnetic field. Okay? So let me go back. I'll come back to this slide once more, but let me go back to this uh, stuff now. Okay. So first of all, is this derivation clear? It clearly is on the back of the envelope hand waving calculations. Okay. So it should be straightforward. But if you have any questions, we can uh, certainly discuss. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If there are no questions, then I can go ahead. So as we saw that the total number of states is um, uh, okay. So so now what we have is that we can calculate the density of state, which means that uh, in real space, which means that how many states do you have per unit? Area. So that's easy because I know that my total number of states is uh, n max, which was area divided by one over two pi l b square, and therefore the density of state would be that n max divided by area, which is this one over two by L B square. Okay. So now you see that the number of such states, or that, and also the density of states, is basically. Um, okay. Before going into that, let me just go back to this uh, other slide. Uh, sorry about changing this so much, but uh, notice that uh, this formula n max being equal to a over 2 pi l b square has a very nice semi-classical interpretation. This is this pi times l b square, forget about the factor of 2 now, but this pi times l b square is roughly the area of the cyclotron radius, cyclotron orbit that an electron moves on semi-classically in the presence of a magnetic field. So it just tells you that this number of states is the total number of cyclotron orbits that you can fit in the area of your sun. Okay. And that makes a lot of sense because you know this gives you a connection between the semi-classical and the quantum. So my density of state is now two pi l b square, and as I increase my magnetic field, I increase the number of possible states in the lowest Langer. Now the integer Hall effect is the case where this number, the number of states in the lowest Langer level, is exactly equal to the total number of electrons in the sample. Okay. Now, let's say we are sitting right at that point. Okay, we have one field Landau levels and all other Landau levels are empty. So that the Fermi level is between the first and the second Landau levels. Okay. Now, if I, of course, decrease the magnetic field, I'll fill up the second Landau level and then the third Landau level. So in general, I can have n field Landau levels. Okay. 
but we could do with one. That's also okay. So now the classical formula for Hall conductance is, of course, this A C over B times C Y. That's your current in the x direction. Okay. Now this A N is of course the density of electron. But instead of this density, if I can just um, replace this density by this density of states, because we know that uh, the density is total number of electrons by area divided by the sample area. And this density of states is the number of available electrons divided by the sample. So in the event where the number of electrons is same as the number of available states, in let's say in Landau level, uh, then n must be equal to rho naught times n. Okay. Where rho naught is the density of state and n is essentially the number of field and others. This one can take to be one if this. Then if I just put this rho naught out here, you see this rho naught is one over two pi L B square and L B square is x over E B. So I put everything here. And this n naught is really n, sorry for that mistake. Uh, n naught is just the number of field and levels. And everything cancels and you get e square over h times an integer, which is the number of pin lambda levels, which gives you a very simple heuristic derivation of this uh, thing, uh, sigma xy to be e square over h times n. Okay. So uh, that's the thing that I alluded to in the last class. I and mean, this is the more complete derivation of stuff. So, uh, okay, before I go back, and tackle other aspects of quantum hall. Any questions regarding this? Hello. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, I couldn't follow the arguments that uh, you used to derive the degeneracy here. Can you please? Uh, I mean, Which argument could we be a little more specific, uh, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, uh, in in saying that we need this x naught to be around uh, l x to be less than l x. Uh, oh, here. Uh, this x not. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, x not is less than l x because your sample dimension is l x in the x direction. Okay, and your coordinate shift of your wave function that has to be within the sample. It cannot go out of the sample. I see. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so the maximum x not is just l x. Okay. Okay. Is that clear? All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, so if we change the tem temperature, for increase the temperature, then some electrons will. Zero temperature, actually. Oh, everything is zero temperature, okay. Yeah, yeah, everything is zero temperature. Or at least temperatures which is much lower than the gap between the first and the second level. Okay. Okay. But, uh, your ground state is the only thing that is contributing to anything that you calculate. Okay. Okay. Yeah, of course, you can change temperature. What would happen is that uh, the sigma xy is no longer going to be an integer. You are going to get a correction, which is the Fermi factor. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Some electrons will go up. Yeah, of course. Some electrons will go to other levels and stuff like that. And that's uh, typical Fermi factor physics. Okay. Yes, sir. A Fermi function which is going to tell you how much of it is going to be sigma xy and how much it's going to be different. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, I can't hear you. Could you be a bit long, uh, louder? Uh, is, this, is it audible? Yeah. So, uh, like, I want to know the uh, role of disorder. Uh, please... Yes, come to that. Okay, okay. Then, then I will ask this question later. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now, let me go back to this slide. Okay. So, you don't have. Uh, sir, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, this phenomenon of quantum Hall effect is dependent upon the type of material or not. Type of this phenomenon of uh, quantum Hall effect is dependent <laughs> upon the type of material or not. Type of what? Sorry? The, uh, the phenomenon of quantum Hall effect is dependent upon the type of material or not. Sorry, I don't get it. trying to say whether it depends on the type of material or not. Oh, type of material. Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, you have to have this. Uh, 
See, the point is this. You have to, your material must have this two-dimensional structure. Okay. And there has to be this hollow, so, once you have, so that once you apply a magnetic field, you need to have, uh, you know, you, you, you need to have this lambda level structure. Also, it tolerates a certain amount of disorder, but the material cannot be too disordered because otherwise you are never going to get to this limit where you get this quantum hole. Okay, but if these two things are satisfied, if you have a two-dimensional uh, hole, so two-dimensional electron gas, and you have, uh, which is clean enough, okay, uh, then I don't think it depends on material. So, uh, as you told that, uh, that this phenomenon happens at t equal to zero Kelvin, correct? Right. right. This phenomenon. The phenomenon you told happens at t equal to zero Kelvin. Uh, no, it happens that it, this is the okay. So the sigma x y is quantized to e square over h times an integer at uh -huh. the which are small compared to the lambda level energy gap. So, uh, my, my, I have a confusion that uh, some of the elements at lower temperature become superconductor. No, so then, okay, I get your point, but the semiconductors don't. Okay, uh -huh. at low temperature, I mean temperatures of the order of for temperatures small compared to uh, these magnetic fields, and there, these semiconductors, you know, that I'm talking about allium arsenide samples or graphing for that which also shows this kind of uh, Hall effect, they do not become superconductors. If okay, okay. it's in, then of course you are not going to see this physics. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Right, thank you. Any other questions? Great. So let me get back to this original uh, this thing. Okay. Uh, okay. So now, uh, the point is that, okay, so this I have already gone through in the last class, so I'm not going to get into the details. The only thing that is uh, important here is this bulk cage correspondence. So corresponding to this uh, lambda levels in the bulk, you have some uh, tidal edge states, which we looked into the last class. And that's the signature of our, the tidality of these states is a signature of this broken time universal symmetry. No, before going on to the next part, let me just talk about a bit about disorder. See, the interesting thing about this quantum Hall effect is not so much that it shows uh, sigma xy to be an integer at uh, some specific filling fraction, like where the first Landau level is completely filled. Uh, the interesting thing is that now if you change your magnetic field a little bit, or if you change your, if you make your sample a little bit disordered, then this quantity doesn't change. And that is why this conductivity is so robust. And one can show that this happens because um, the conductivity only uh, gets a contribution from certain properties of the ground state wave function, which disorder doesn't destroy. Okay? And that is in fact that the graph, it's indeed the very phase of the ground state wave function. So I'm not going to get into the details of this in this class because quantum Hall effect is not the main thing that I want to talk about. But this robustness against disorder up to a point, okay, and uh, robustness also against interaction, uh, again up to a point, is the main uh, reason why this quantum Hall uh, effect gains so much attention. So talking about disorder, I think uh, if you put in a disorder. So what happens when you put in a disorder is that the lambda levels, you know, which were one single energy, now gets a break due to this disorder. And as long as the disorder strength is small compared to the lambda level separation, the, uh, this physics of quantum Hall effect doesn't change. Okay. The same goes with interaction. If the interaction doesn't mix between different lambda levels, then uh, this quantum Hall stuff is all okay. Okay, so I'm not going to talk any more about it, but I can answer questions at the end of the lecture if that's necessary. Okay, so now um, let me get into the next slide. So, uh, okay, so this also I went through. So this is just to show that the quantum Hall effect can be looked into uh, as a very potential. And uh, 
the physical quantities such as so the important point is that the physical quantities such as the hall conductance just what we derived can be understood in terms of topology and this topology is a, is a topology in the space of this wave function okay here uh, for um, so and we are going to see examples of this later okay so i'm not going to harbor more on this at this point so let me now tell you why this bulk uh, why having a topological invariant in the bulk is important uh, sorry it leads to gapless states at the edge and this phenomenon which is widely present in many condensed matter sample is called the bulk edge correspondence and this is a very robust phenomenon which again doesn't depend on the detail of the system so the statement is that if you have a topological invariant okay something like uh, a conduct quantized conductivity or maybe you know uh, a quantized charge or something like that in the bulk then you cannot so where the bulk terminates to vacuum that is at the edge of this sample there must be gapless states now why is this the case in the case of quantum hall effect there is a very simple way to understand this and i'm going to make a more comprehensive argument about this when i discuss uh, other topological systems like the wild semi metal or uh, stuff like that but let me just give you the argument in uh, context of this uh, quantum hall effect right now so imagine that you have these electrons okay in the presence of this strong magnetic field coupled to a weak external electromagnetic field which is often called a prof field because you want to measure the properties of this electron such as conductivity using that prof field and the uh, and this prof field is weak okay so what do you do in order to measure this prof field you uh, write down the hamiltonian or effectively the action of the system in presence of this um, of the electrons in presence of this prof field and then there is a procedure called integrating out the electron degrees of freedom that is you want to find out the response of the system with respect to the prof field and that you do by integrating out the electron degrees of freedom that's one way of deriving something called an effective action now i don't want to get into the details of this effective action calculation but let's say that somebody gave me this effective action and this is sort of the effective action term for this quantum hall system so what you have is this sigma xy sitting right here and then there is a a mu f mu lambda kind of term this is f mu lambda is of course you know the standard electromagnetic tensor and a mu is the vector potential okay now uh this let me again go back to this transparency okay so suppose i have this effective action now i want to check so let's say that you know i wanted to check my calculation and one way to check whether i have done things okay is to see that that the action the effective action that you get must be invariant under a gauge transformation because you know action is i mean this action is of course something physical and uh, it cannot depend on the gauge that you choose so let's say i make a gauge transformation which is a mu going to a mu plus del mu lambda okay and uh, sorry and this f mu lambda is uh, just uh, you know del mu a lambda minus del lambda a mu that's the standard uh, electromagnetic tensor so under this transformation s goes to s plus delta s where delta s is this quantity okay uh, that you have a del mu lambda here multiplying f mu lambda and there is a epsilon mu lambda now this i can always write as two terms one which is a full derivative okay sorry i uh, yeah one which is a full derivative out here okay uh on lambda and f mu lambda and then there is another term which is lambda times del mu f mu lambda now this del mu f mu lambda is certainly zero because of anti symmetry because you are always going to have a combination of del mu del mu and that with this anti symmetric tensor is just going to give you zero because the order of the derivatives do not matter however for this term to be zero you need to carry out this integral and demand that the fields go to zero at the surface now typically when we do quantum field theory what do we do we say that well this surface is really at special infinity and everything dies out at special infinity 
However, in a sample where there is a bulk uh, and an edge, this, uh, this is not a special infinity. In fact, you are uh, getting something right at the edge. Okay, so this DLA is one of the edge element and DT, and this is delta X. So you see that there is no reason for this vector potential to be zero at the edge of the sample, okay, because you are putting an external electromagnetic field which could be everywhere. And therefore, there is no, therefore, it seems that we get this nonsensical answer well, delta S is not equal to zero. So this cannot be because, you know, if delta S is not equal to zero, this means that your action is gauge dependent, which is clearly nonsensical. So the only solution to this problem, which Wilczek came up with, uh, is that you must have some other degrees of freedom at the edge whose gauge transformation must cancel this delta S term. Okay, and that shows that gauge invariance naturally leads to having age modes. And if you develop on this argument a little bit more, which I'm again not going to do, you can show that this is going to lead to chiral, gapless, linear dispersing modes at the edge. Okay, so delta S, this non zero value has to be cancelled by some fields which lives on the surface. Okay, and that's why. Uh, this also shows that a very general principle, like just like gauge invariance, uh, okay, I can't move my, oh, yeah. A very general principle, just like gauge invariance, essentially guarantees that you are going to have some gapless surface modes, provided uh, you have a topological invariant at the bar. This also can be explained in another way that if you have a topological invariant in the bulk, that means that your system is characterized by an integer. In this case, it's the integer which quantizes sigma xy, okay? Sigma xy is quantized to e square over h times this integer. Now, this integer really cannot just directly go to zero once you get out of the sample. For this to happen, you must have, uh, as well, so this integer is protected as long as your ground state is protected from the excited states by a gap. And therefore, if it has to go to zero, there must be a gapless regime through which this sample, uh, through which you must pass. And that happens to be the age of the sample, which also tells you that the sample must have gapless age modes. Okay. So these are some quite general arguments, which tells you that having an integer in the bulk, or a topological integer invariant in the bulk must lead to gapless surface modes. Okay. So, any questions regarding this? Uh, uh, sorry, sir. Can you repeat the argument for the edge modes to be gapless? Uh, okay. So, in the bulk, you have this topological invariant, which is protected by the fact that your ground state is uh, separated from the rest of the excited state by a gap. Okay. Right. So, for this invariant to change from some integer to zero, which it does when you go to vacuum. I see. Okay. Pass through your, you have to pass through a region that there are gapless uh, excitations. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, and that happens to be the edge. Uh, and sir, uh, what precisely do we mean by gapless? So it means that uh, creating excitations as zero energy costs. I see. Okay. Standard gapless. I mean, so if you put in a photon, it's going to create an excitation, but the minimum photon frequency that you need to create that excitation goes to zero. Okay. Uh, and sir, one more thing. Uh, so initially we talked about uh, coupling the system with a probe electromagnetic field, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is that different from the magnetic field which... Uh, yes, it is different from the magnetic field which is giving rise to this Hall effect. So you have the magnetic field which is given rise to this Hall effect, and that's a static magnetic field which is not small, that you have to treat exactly. But on top of that, now you put in a small electromagnetic field, okay, and you study the response of the system in, uh, to that electromagnetic field. Okay, okay. 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 That's a standard linear response field, actually. Okay. The field, uh, put in a voltage, measure the current. Okay, magnetic field is the field corresponding to that voltage. Oh, all right. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask a question? 
Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what is the reason that uh, when one derives this action uh, Hello? that you that you don't? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah. So, uh, the, the question I have is uh, this action uh, that you wrote down here. I mean, what is the reason that uh, it cannot capture this uh, this eighth state? Uh, because I haven't really put in the boundary condition while calculating this action. Okay. Okay. Uh, bulk sample. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? Okay. If not, let me move on. So uh, now, okay. So this is the story about integer quantum Hall effect. Now, after that, people made cleaner samples and they went to higher magnetic field. And this higher magnetic field is really an interesting area. Uh, if, if you think about it, this higher magnetic field essentially means that your number of states in the lowest lambda level is larger than the number of electrons that you have. Okay? This means that all the electrons in your sample at zero temperature has exactly the same kinetic energy, which is the energy of this lowest lambda level. Right, which is h bar omega uh, half h bar omega. Okay, so the kinetic energy is completely quenched in the sense that uh, you know if you measure your energy from this half h bar omega, all the electrons simply have zero energy. So, or in other words, the band of energy uh, has a width zero. Okay, the kinetic energy. This means that all these electrons, you know, and a macroscopic number of them is now completely degenerate. You can arrange them in any possible way that uh, the that Pauli principle allows you to. And if you just consider the kinetic energy, there is no difference in energy between these electrons. Okay, So there is a huge degeneracy. And it's left up to the interaction between the electrons to leave this degeneracy and give you a kosher ground state. So this is the first known example uh, or at least the first known experimental example of an infinitely strongly interacting electron gas. Okay, why is it infinitely interact uh, strongly interacting? Because you see the strength of the interaction is measured in terms of strength of the Coulomb interaction divided by the bandwidth of the kinetic energy of the electrons. That bandwidth is points to zero by the magnetic field, and therefore it's a really infinitely strongly interacting. Okay, so of course this is a very difficult problem, and uh, there is no uh, sense of doing any kind of perturbation theory or anything that we know of, and that's why Laughlin came in and one fine morning with a coffee cup he wrote down a wave function, which essentially has the following features. You see, so uh, what Laughlin said is that look, I have uh, of course what I want to have is that this electron, oops, sorry, these electrons must not be on top of each other. That's banned by Pauli exclusion principle. And also, they have to pay an energy cost if they come near each other because uh, of Coulomb interaction. So the wave function, and this is a many-body wave function in the first quantized language, something that you are not going to see many times in condensed matter, uh, is going to be, is going to have a factor like this. Okay. Uh, which essentially goes to zero when z z, where z is x minus r, uh, x plus or x minus i y, x and y are the special coordinates. Okay, uh, they they come too close to each other, and they go with a zero power q, where q is the one over the filling factor, and this filling factor is essentially telling you how much stronger the magnetic field is. Um, well, uh, how many? So it's a ratio of number of states in the uh, lowest lambda level divided by the um, uh, ratio between the number of states in the lowest lambda level and the number of electrons present. So, for example, when this uh, filling factor is uh, uh, one third, okay, which means Q equal to three, this means that there are three times as many states in the lowest lambda level compared to the number of available electrons. So this idea is uh, put in a slightly different perspective. Uh, so essentially what comes out is that if you take this wave function and then you do the calculation that Laughlin does, 
it shows you that uh, you are going to see a uh, quantized hull conductance but now instead of an integer you are going to see a quantized hull conductance at 1 over q that is at one third and uh, you see that if you look at this here is a plot of this hull resistance okay and you see that uh, this is the integer hull plate out here okay where there is a one written and somewhere you are going to find the one third out here which is i think somewhere around okay i don't see a one third here for some reason this is two third and probably okay i don't really see where this one third is but uh, it should be there okay so for example you could have a two third or something like that okay and uh, those are this plateaus that uh, one has okay so so the point is the following so you can so in this experiment you not only see the integer plateaus but you also see many fractions and these fractions occurs some of these fractions occurs at a magnetic field which is stronger than that required to be in the integer quantum hall effect regime so that your lowest lambda level is not totally full that's an infinitely strongly interacting problem and laughlin gave a solution to the wave function of this problem and uh, therefore and this led, led to um, sigma xy being e square over h times 1/3 okay also what laughlin could show is that if you now um, hit this ground state with some perturbation such as a photon or something like that you are going to generate charged quasi particles but the charge of this quasi particles would be fractional and it's given by again this factor q which is uh, one over q so the charge is just the filling factor which is one over q okay so this this leads to something called charge fractionalization and this is one of the well the second known example of charge fractionalization in condensed matter physics the first one is something that i'm going to talk about later so so after this jain came around and he gave this idea that uh, the fractional quantum hall effect of fermions can be at a, understood as integer form quantum hall effect of some effective objects called composite fermions and these effective objects are obtained by attaching some flux tubes you know see this picture so there is this electrons and one has attached this flux tubes and this is at one third so there are three flux tube attached to this so you know attach an integer number of odd integer number of flux tubes to that and the resultant thing is called a composite fermion and this composite fermion essentially uh, explains this fractional quantum hall effect in a very standard manner where well, this is now all well known but all i am going to try to say is that um, this is one example where strong interaction leads to fractionalization and on top of that this field was also the first one in which the um, effect of topology in condensed matter physics was uh, was sort of realized okay so i'm not going to talk about this fractional quantum hall effect anymore because uh, i want to go to simpler systems so uh, any questions regarding this okay. can i ask a question kishan yeah please ah, so uh, in this in you said in the previous slide that there is a quench of this kinetic energy so uh, is this sort of I, i still see that in the laughlin wave function there is still this gaussian so the wave function is not completely flat right or uh, so so in the wave function no no sure the wave function is not completely flat but the point is look, that this doesn't so this thing so the so the point is that this z, mod z i square you know the it's there in the wave function but that's just a single particle wave function so yeah. in, if you didn't have this thing you were going to just create a slater determinant of the single particle wave function right okay but the point is that any combination that you take is going to give you the same energy nice nice okay okay 
and and this uh, this this polynomial or not not the polynomial the power q factor this yeah. is poorly sort of rigged so that you get out the hall conductance is it that's the uh, or is there a more physical explanation for this also uh, no it's sort of something that laughlin took from uh, you know he took it from uh, um, so this was a guess first okay. of Okay, this guess came from because Laughlin knew very well about interacting plasma, which are charged particles, and there, uh, this uh, to minimize the uh, uh, energy of this plasma, you put in factors like that because they are also you know you sort of basically don't want particles to come too close to one another. Oh. Okay, so he just tried that philosophy here, and it turned out that it works. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. Sure. uh okay any other questions or should i move on okay let me move on actually so okay so uh, next let me come to an example so another example of topology which manifests itself in phase transitions so we know all know what phase transition is uh, it's a change of state of matter okay typically it happens as a function of either uh, temper as a function of temperature or maybe pressure and stuff like that so there is a theoretical description of this and this is a competition of between so uh, the typical classical phase transition is a con consequence of competition between entropy which prefers a ordered state and usually wins over uh, sorry i prefer the disordered state and usually wins over at um, high high temperature and internal energy which prefers an order state and usually wins over at low temperature where the effect of entropy is small however in condensed matter we now understand that uh, transitions can happen just because of the quantum nature of the problem now to understand this let's think of a uh, zero temperature and by zero temperature i really don't physic mean that the temperature is zero physically all i mean is that the temperature is small compared to all other energy scales in the problem now if that is the case you see that the contribution of entropy to the free energy which is t times a so t is the temperature is minuscule so entropy goes out of the picture however the internal energy now has So can have several components. One of them is the kinetic energy. The other one is the potential energy, and these can compete with each other so as to uh, have different possible states. Okay. So, for example, if you have an uh, so we all know this. So, for example, you know, uh, uh, think of an Ising model in the presence of a transverse field. So when the Uh, so this Ising model has a term which gives rise to ferromagnetic interaction between spins and a transverse field which wants the spin to point along x. Okay, that's sort of a transverse field in the x direction. So essentially, what do you see? You see that you know when the transverse field is large, that's like the potential term. Be, uh, sorry, the kinetic uh, well, sort of the magnetic field term being large, and that leads to a paramagnetic phase. Whereas when the interaction term is large, that's like the potential energy term being large, that gives rise to a ferromagnet. So this ferromagnet-paramagnet transition is essentially a competition between two terms in the internal energy of the system. Entropy doesn't play a role here. Okay. So these are typically called uh, quantum phase transition because it's the quantum fluctuations which brings about this phase transition and not the thermal ones. However, be it quantum or classical phase transitions are usually described by a phenomenology that landau came up with so it says that every transition is so landau's thing was that every transition during his time and now we know that most transitions are characterized by an order parameter we still see that there is a function uh which is non zero in the ordered phase what is this function so well that depends on the system so for example if you have a ferromagnet this function could be the magnetization which is non zero in the ordered state and zero in the paramagnetic state in the ferroelectric to standard metal transition this could be the polarization so for example if you have a superconductor this could be the super pair which we talked about you know that's a pairing potential uh and so on okay in ising case it's the ising magnetization and so on Okay. now each of this order any of these order parameters is small at the 
uh, near the transition because that's when the system goes from an ordered state to a disordered state and therefore the magnitude of this order parameter must be small. So Landau's idea was that suppose I expand this scheme in terms of this uh, order parameter near the transition, uh, using this free energy expansion, I can basically uh, describe most of the properties of this phase transition. And this phenomenology is remarkably successful okay, in describing both first and second order transition. Now, the point is that this phenomenology requires that you have a local order parameter corresponding to this transition. Okay. So, this, uh, this type of transitions which has this local order parameter goes by the name of Landau type of phase transition. And what I'm going to show you next is that there could be transitions from one state of matter to another, which are not, uh, which do not constitute having a local order parameter. Okay. So, uh, essentially, this class of transitions are typically termed as topological transitions, and that is another manifestation of topology uh, that comes in condensed matter. So, let me try to give you a very simple example. Okay, and this example is known as the crystallist Hallis transition. That's the simplest example that one has of this topological transition. Well, the crystallist Hallis physics is really very simple. Okay. What it tells you is that if you have a system of spins, which Heisenberg spins, let's say, in uh, 2D, okay, I can think of this as some unit vectors and uh, and say that I have these spins whose magnitude are really fixed. They are spin S objects and uh, this S is fixed. And then the interaction is really interaction between unit vectors because the amplitude can be absorbed in this G. Okay. So, uh, I have a Hamiltonian, which is given by some constant k and cos theta i minus theta j. Now, imagine that I only, so I have to sort of look at this Hamiltonian and find out what the states are. Now, what, what are the possible states? Okay, suppose I put in this constraint that all I do is to change this, all I can do is to change the con these phases a little bit between sides so that I can do a gradient expansion of this cos theta so that the there is no sudden change in phase. The phase change is very gradual in whatever state that comes in. Then clearly I can rate this cos theta as some gradient square okay? because that's just theta i minus theta j square uh, and that can be written as a gradient square if I go into continuity. Now this tells you that if you take this Hamiltonian and you calculate the correlation function uh, of this e to the power i theta minus theta zero, and this is a calculation that one can carry out very easily. I'm not going to do this here, but uh, you know this is not too hard to do. You can show that this goes as a power law, and this is a paradox. Why? Because you see it's a two D system, and Marmin uh, Wagner theorem tells you. That is impossible to have a spontaneous symmetry breaking in d equal to two, and therefore you shouldn't be really observing power law, and that too at any temperature. You know, at high temperature, clearly I know that the system has to be disordered. You know, uh, and you should not be seeing a power law out here. You should be seeing exponentially decaying correlation in the disordered phase. That doesn't happen. Why doesn't that happen? The reason is. What found, what uh, Kostelis, Taulis, and Barjinsky found out, and that's why this KT transition came in, and that was the so one of the reasons why Kostelis and Taulis was awarded the Nobel Prize, is that they found that what is important is that we cannot really neglect configurations of these phases where the phase goes in, uh, where the phase has large variation over short distances, okay? And in typically, one should have vortex configurations allowed. Now, what is this vortex configuration? To show that, let me just go into this um, stuff out here. Okay, so the vortex is a phase configuration of the superfluid or this thetas, where this uh, theta is phi. So this phase is redefined at the center of the vortex. It's the stand inverse of y over x, okay? And then, if you take this theta and take its gradient, you see that uh, it's just that 
So this term is the x derivative of theta, which is minus y over r square, and the y derivative is x over r square. This is something you can easily find, uh, check. So therefore, grad theta squared, if you take this grad theta and dot it with grad theta, is just one over r square. This means that if I take this vortex configuration and calculate the internal energy, I'm going to get a grad theta squared d to r, and with that, I get a pi times j, right, log l over it. Okay? So this, uh, where l is the length of your sample and a is the radius of the vortex code. Okay? But this is just the internal energy part. To calculate the free energy, I also need the entropy. So what is the entropy? Entropy is the number of allowed configuration, which is kb uh, times the number. So it's log times the number of possible vortices. Now, if you have a sample L squared, uh, which has area L squared in 2D, and you have vortices, which is uh, whose core area is A squared, then your total number of vortices possible, that which is also the number of configurations possible, is log of L square over S square. So the entropy is KB log W, which is KB log L square over L A square. And therefore the free energy comes out to be of this form. This tells you that at T greater than TC, which is given by this pi j over 2 KB, oops, uh, pi j over 2 KB, you prefer this free energy becomes negative and you prefer proliferation of vortices in your sample. You want to make as many vortex anti-vortex as you can so that your free energy is lower. Okay. On the other hand, that T less than TC, these vortices cannot proliferate because creating a vortex anti-vortex pair or a vortex essentially is energetically costly. So there is a transition at TC, but that transition is, is goes through the signature of this transition is proliferation of vortices in your sample. And because these vortices are extended objects, they are not local objects, this transition do not go about by creating local, uh, this vortice, this transition does not have a local order parameter. Okay. And this is the postal list how this transition. So there is a TC and Above this TC, you have these vortexes and anti-vortex pairs, whereas below TC, these vortex and anti-vortex, uh, they just form some local um, bound objects. Okay. And if you keep in this vortex anti-vortex pair, you correctly find that at T greater than TC, your correlation functions are exponentially damped, whereas uh, below them, they go as some power. Okay. And this thing also can bypass margin Wagner theorem because there is no local order parameter. Okay. So you can have this kind of transitions in 2D, whereas you cannot have them, or you cannot have standard uh, you know, uh, uh, local order parameter transition in 2D. Okay. So this is another example where topology or topological objects or vortices essentially plays a central role in properties of the system. Okay. So, okay. So essentially, what we have now is, uh, so what we found is that we have discussed the role of topology in several condensed matter systems. So now I am going to stop here and then start talking about typical systems where this kind of topological stuff is uh, manifest. Okay. So uh, any questions till now? So this uh, the in the uh, for the KT transition the first uh, calculation you did where every yeah. it was uh, algebraic for all temperatures. Um, yeah. I kind of quickly missed. Uh, so in this calculation somehow it, it is assumed that you cannot have vortex configuration. That's right. That so you just put this. You just put this Hamiltonian to be grad theta r squared, where grad theta is small. So you do not keep vortices. You just say spin waves, okay? okay. And then for spin waves, uh, if you just keep up spin wave Hamiltonian and do this correlation calculation, then you have this. So, so that is like, uh, so, so I'm just trying to understand what, so in this calculation, you ignore something, like you ignore some configurations or how do you remove, I mean, I'm, I'm just, 
I've always seen the other one. So <laughs> this is why I uh, sure I understand. So here, what you do is that uh, this configuration, you know, you, you just keep this cosine theta uh -huh. uh, that you put in as uh, some grad theta square. That's uh -huh. all. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. So you see that what it means? It means that you are allowing this phase to go from zero to infinity. Right. 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 But really, the phase can go from zero to two pi, and then when it goes close to two pi, you have to consider the vortex sector. Right. Right. That vortex sectors are something you are throwing out of the problem. Got it. Got it. You, so that's where, uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay. If not, let me uh, go to the next. Uh, uh, Talk which I should have started from today, but already I'm one hour late. But that's okay, as long as. Uh, so let me just uh, open up this lecture two, which I'm now going to share. Okay, so now for the next few lectures. I'm going to, uh, in step by step, talk about certain materials whose low energy properties are um, determined by either Dirac or wild type of um, uh, actions and uh, materials whose properties uh, contains inherently topology built in them. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to introduce you to graphene, which was the first material of this kind that came in. Okay, uh, in 2005, and then I'm going to talk about topological insulators followed by while and uh, Dirac semi-metals. Okay, and then Maharana fermions in superconductors. So uh, let me just uh, go in step by step. So uh, as before, I mean, you know, uh, although I'm horribly late, uh, I mean, behind schedule, but that doesn't really matter. Just ask as many questions as you can uh, because there is no syllabus to finish. So, uh, first thing is introduction to graphene. So, let me just come directly to the first slide. So, what is graphene? So, we all know what graphite is, right? Graphite is a 3D allotrope of carbon. And this is the thing that you find on your pencil tips. Okay, so that's the standard graph. Now, graphite has many interesting properties. And one of the first persons who actually studied them experimentally was K.S. Krishnan, who did a series of very interesting experiments actually sitting in IACS, which I'm uh, kind of happy about, uh, where uh, he showed that uh, the properties of this graphite are highly anisotropic. Okay. So why does this anisotropic properties come about? The reason they come about is the structure of graphite. So graphite essentially are two-dimensional hexagonal planes of carbon atoms, which are stacked over each other. And the coupling is very strong between carbon atoms in a plane, but they are pretty weak when it comes to carbon atom between different planes. Okay? And uh, concomitantly, this graphite, therefore, uh, this graphite one can show is a very good conductor of both heat and electricity along the plane, but very poor conductor perpendicular to the plane. Okay? So people knew for long that. You know, because of this weak coupling between planes, there, uh, if one, it is not entirely impossible to separate out these planes and form one single layer of graphite, which will then be called as graphene, two-dimensional form of graphite. However, its experimental separation has been a long-standing challenge, because you know, typically what people do to separate these planes experimentally is to cleave them. However, cleaving these things can give rise to a few hundred layers of graphite. That's the thinnest that you can get, maybe a hundred, but not more than that. So Andre Gaim in Manchester was the first person, as you know, to achieve this. And there is a very interesting story that happened in Gaim's lab. And uh, let me try to um, tell you that. So Gaim, Gaim had a uh, postdoc, and uh, he was a very diligent and you know hardworking postdoc, and he was it was so he essentially wanted to sort of look at this problem of graphene, 
and Graham, Graham gave him some good quality crystals of graphite and asked him to cleave it to get up to a few layers. So after a few very frustrating months, uh, this postdoc came back and asked Graham that, you know, I tried, but, uh, well, you know, I really cannot get to less than 100 layers. And Graham, of course, was a busy, uh, uh, you know, uh, busy physicist. And so he just told his postdoc, why don't you go and try some more? And the postdoc being uh, really, you know, at, it with, at his wit's end, just told Gaim that, why don't you try it? So Gaim took up the challenge, okay? And he realized that the postdoc was absolutely correct. So there is no way that cleaving is going to give you this few layers. But being the smart physicist he is, he came up with something different. What he realized is that while cleaving this graphite, just before cleaving, what you do is to polish its surface by uh, putting in a scotch tape, by just rubbing it with a scotch tape. And when this happens, because the graphite layers are really, really, um, you know, uh, have really weak uh, interlayer um, coupling, what happens is that some, uh, some of these flakes of graphite, which is just a few layers, come on from the surface and they just stick to this scotch tape. So after realizing this, Andergaim really uh, put his scotch tips this, uh, under microscope and then he could find a few layers of graphite, including a single layer. And then that was his sample. Okay. So lateral thinking is really the way to go. And this is what gave him this graphene. And, okay. So let's just talk about relevant basics about graphene. Okay. So graphene is uh, is carbon in sp2 hybridized form, okay, and which is also the thing about graphite. So in uh, graphite or graphene, uh, carbon atoms have this sp2 hybridized con configuration, and it has some pz orbitals left. Okay, so each unit cell has two electrons. Um, okay, so and when you bring them together, this p orbitals fuse to form what is called a pi bond and this sp2 hybridized orbitals fuse to form the sigma bond of graphene. Now, if you bring many of them close to each other, electrons from this pi bond, they form a continuum, which is called the delocalized pi band of graphene. And this pi band essentially contributes to all the conduction electrons. Okay, so that's the chemistry part. In the physicist, it's a very different problem. Graphite is a honeycomb lattice. Okay, so this hexagonal lattice that you see, and uh, it's just to them, they, uh, this is just a tight binding problem where three electrons move in between, um, you know, between different sides of this lattice. Now, graphite essentially has two inequivalent sides because of this hexagonal lattice. So you see that if I look into this A sub lattice side of graphite, it turns out that its surroundings, you see, forms an Y. Whereas that of a B sub lattice forms an inverted Y. And therefore, from a crystallographic point of view, this A and B sub lattices are completely different. Okay. They, they are not crystallographically similar because their surroundings are different in the crystal. Okay. So therefore, there are two inequivalent sites, A and B. And one can talk. So if this happens, one can start to, and if electrons hop around these uh, sites, one can certainly talk about probability of an electron to be on an A sub lattice or that on a B sub lattice. And this can be thought about up and down spin, uh, down states of a fictitious spin. So I can always say that, look, if my electron is on A sub lattice, I'm going to talk, I'm going to say that it has a pseudo spin up. And if it is on a B sub lattice, I'm going to say that it has a pseudo spin down. Okay. So this is because I can write my wave function as a two component wave function. The first component gives me the probability amplitude of the electron to be on A sub lattice and the second one is B sub lattice. So this is really because it's a two component spin, a two component wave function, it's really like a spin up object, okay? But this is not the physical spin. That's why in the graphene literature, this is called a pseudo spin. Okay, so that's the first terminology. Uh, so when I say something is pseudo spin up, what I really mean is that the electron resides entirely on A sub lattice. And pseudo spin X, so if somebody's pseudo spin is on, uh, is, is an eigenstate of X, C 
sigma x, what it means is that it's in an equal superposition state between A and B subjects. Okay. I hope that point is clear. If not, uh, can you please let me know because this is a very important point for uh, graphing physics. Questions? Okay, if not, let me go on. So now the model of the kinetic energy that the electron comes in about is uh, in this thing is just hopping. And for our purpose, we are going to just take uh, the fact that the electrons hop between neighboring sides uh, of the lattice. Okay. So let me just go back to this uh, hold on. So let me just uh, share. Uh, oops. Yeah, let me share this slide. So, uh, so the electron essentially hops between an A and a B sub lattice because the nearest neighbor of any A sub lattice site is all B sub lattice and vice versa. So, essentially, what we have, um, essentially, what we have is that the electron hops from A to B in this three direction. And the vectors which characterizes this hopping are called tau 1, tau 2, and tau 3, given here. So really the Hamiltonian, the hopping Hamiltonian, is electron moving from an A sublattice to a B sublattice, which means I am destroying an electron on a B sublattice and creating it at A sublattice. That's just a CA dagger CB, and the coordinates are R of CA and R plus tau for CB. Tau i, okay, i takes value 1, 2, 3. Now, this kind of stuff is best solved by going into Fourier space, and that is again because you have transition invariance in the problem. So, uh, if you move to Fourier space, you just do a Fourier transform of this. That tells you that you have a CK a dagger CKB times of H of k, where H of k is just the Fourier transform of this quantity. And this is a straightforward thing to do. If you just take this Hamiltonian and do a Fourier transform, expand these fields in its Fourier mode, you are going to get this. Okay. And given this tau, and given that k is kx and ky, this h of k is just this quantity. It depends on ky and kx. So you see that if I put my momentum to be minus 4 pi by 3 square root of 3a, okay, and 0, then this h of k goes to zero because cosine of this quantity becomes minus half at this uh, value of this k and ky zero means this is one plus two times minus half and the whole thing goes to zero. What does this mean? The energy bands because of this structure is plus or minus mod h k. The plus one is the conduction band and minus one is the valence band. And h k going to zero essentially means that these bands touch each other. And therefore, the bands touch each other at the edge of this Brillouin zone of graphene. The Brillouin zone of graphene is also hexagonal. Okay. So let me go back to this point. Sorry, this let me go back. Uh, Yeah, so you see that this H of K is what I derived, and the two energy bands are plus or minus uh, mod H K, okay? And if I plot them, I find this band structure, okay? And energy of K, which is just mod of H K, which you can calculate from the expression that I showed you, is just this quantity. And you see around this, you know, these points at the edge of this Brillouin zone, this H of K goes to, uh, H of k and hence E of k goes to zero, and you have two dispersing bands out here. Now, okay, so this I would claim is a manifestation of Dirac physics. Why is that the case? To see this again, let me go back to the supplementary slides. Uh, which probably, probably this is not that straight in this.
Yeah. So around key point, suppose I extend this, but just by, oh, sorry, let me just put this out here. So suppose now I am around the K point of graphing, where capital K X is four pi by three root three A, and capital K Y is zero, and I expand my Hamiltonian around that K point. So I have a delta K Y and delta K X. So I just need to expand my function H of K, and uh, you can try this. Uh, you see that uh, you know this quantity just becomes sorry. There would be a H bar here, H bar V F times delta K X minus I delta K Y. So my Hamiltonian around this becomes a two by two Hamiltonian with a linear dispersing elements and a two by two metric structure. So which means that this is Dirac-like because in two dimension Dirac theory is just described by Pauli matrices. That is this matrices out here, and this pseudo spin takes the form of Dirac spins out here. Because remember that these two by two structure is in the sublattice space. Okay. So this wave function is A sublattice and B sublattice wave function. So essentially, uh, the pseudo spin takes the role of Dirac spins. Now imagine that I diagonalize this uh, matrix. This is very simple because it's a two by two matrix. I'm just going to get this B mod K, which is the linearly dispersing Dirac mode. And if I find the eigen vector, I'm going to find that this quantity. <laughs> Essentially, is going to be one e to the power i theta k. That's your eigen vector, and theta k is tan inverse k y over k x. That is just the angle made by this electron when it moves in momentum space. Okay. So this angle is zero if the momentum uh, if the electron moves along x. It's pi by two if the electron moves along y. Okay. So now uh, let me go back to this. Um, Other part. Uh, yeah, right here. Okay. okay. So now, uh, of course, I have talked about this k point, but there is also a k prime point, and one can sort of do the same thing there. Uh, and you get this Hamiltonian, which is not too different from what you get around k point. It's just that the factor k x comes with a minus sign, but other than that, it's exactly the same. But let me take this opportunity to define a few terminologies for you. The first one is pseudo spin, which is this Pauli matrix sigma, which is the two by two matrix associated with the two sublattices, the A and the B sides, and then there is this valley. Okay, which is the k and the k prime points. These two are the two values, and then of course you have the real spin. Mm -hmm. But now I'm going to just be around the k point and then point out one property which uh, this graphing electrons have. Okay, and that would be the last thing that I do today. So here is the thing about this graphing electron. Okay, so. The wave function of this graphing electron is one e to the power i theta or gamma, whatever. This gamma is the angle in this momentum space. So now think of an electron which moves along x, okay, so that k y is equal to zero. Then of course gamma is equal to zero, and this wave function is one one. Now this one one is of course an eigenstate of sigma x. That is the pseudo spin of this electron points along. X when it moves along X, and you can do this with any other direction of motion, okay? And you would always see that the pseudo spin of the electrons around this k point always points along its direction of motion. Okay. In the k prime, you can do the same thing around the k prime point, and you are going to find that the pseudo spin points opposite to its direction of motion. Therefore, there is a definite helicity property which is associated with this electron. It swaps the direction of its spin is tied to its direction of uh, its uh, its motion in momentum space. Now we know about this helicity uh, from context of particle physics. So any fermion which is relativistic and which has zero mass shows this helicity property. Neutrinos would be a good example if they didn't have a mass, but now we know that neutrinos do have a mass. Uh, Uh, but here, this property, this helicity property, is mimicked by graphene. 
okay and then there are two more things that i want to talk about in this graphing before calling it a day and these two are essentially right here the first one uh it's probably here it's about the density of state okay of this dirac electron so we found that this dirac uh, so the graphing dispersion is this linear dispersion so what is the density of state so the density of state is given by rho of epsilon which is just the sum over momenta delta function of epsilon minus e of k which is the energy dispersion it just counts how many states are there between an energy epsilon and epsilon plus d epsilon okay so it turns out that if you do this it tells you that this density of state it's a very simple calculation so i'm not going to go through the details of it is proportional to the energy as measured from the dirac cone point so this means that as you approach the dirac cone the number of available electrons uh, states that is available for conduction or anything like that essentially vanishes and right at the dirac point there are zero available states for uh, the system uh, to conduct electricity this is why graphene is called a semi metal it's metallic because it's not gapped like an insulator there is a dirac cone and therefore it's not gapped however the number of available states is uh, vanishes as you approach the dirac point and therefore it's a semi metal okay and this is to be construct, contrasted with the standard fermi uh, theory where where standard fermi liquids are you know standard uh, metals in three dimension where the density of state around the fermi surface is a constant okay the last thing and uh, that i want to do is to show that this dirac electrons uh, indeed is a so if you have this dirac structure in momentum space this indeed leads to a topologically non trivial winding up so to know this we know that the wave function of graphene is 1 e to the power i theta k where theta is the angle in momentum space okay so we talked about this berry phase in the context of wave functions before so here the parameter that is valid for this berry potential is just the momentum so if you take the berry potential which is the derivative of the berry phase superposed with psi star so it's a it's psi star del k psi i have two such components okay i can take it to be kx and ky so i get ax and ay okay but i can also take it to be mod uh, k and theta k okay do i can choose cylindrical coordinates and just take the derivatives in those and therefore uh, let me do that and the reason i want to do that is that the wave function doesn't depend on mod k so the first uh, component is zero because del mod k of psi is zero and the second component just gives me a 1 over mod k times an i and because this derivative is 1 over mod k del del theta and if you just carry this out you are going to get a i minus k and then if you do a del k over a contour which is a circular contour enclosing this dirac point you are going to pick up a phase of 2 pi this is exactly the same phase that you picked up when you circulated a vortex in real space here you just circulated in momentum space and just as the phase of the vortex is ill defined in real space at the core here the angle theta k is ill defined at the dirac point where mod k goes to zero okay and therefore these dirac points correspond to a topological winding number n which is 1 and uh, therefore it's like a vortex in momentum space and this is why any material whose low energy quasi particles are dirac like or wild like essentially are topological objects because these points are just like vortices but in momentum space okay and we're going to see in the next uh, lecture what are the consequences of having this uh, kind of structure in uh, in uh, graphing and then in topological insulators okay so i think i have i'm going to stop here and take questions it has already been quite a bit of uh, stuff so any questions oh sir 
Yeah, so all this Dirac structure that you were talking about, uh, that is uh, uh, that's related to the pseudo spin index, right? Yes. Uh, so when you also talked about the helicity, that would be the helicity of the pseudo spin. That's right. So the pseudo spin of this electron is going to point along x if it is moving along x, which means that the electron is going to be in an equal superposition of psi a and psi b that is its amplitude over a and b sub lattices are going to be equal with a relative phase zero that's your pseudo spin x okay 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 yeah so uh, just to make this clear this is not with real spin okay yeah any other questions Uh, sir, I have a question about the uh, fractional quantum one effect. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, when you are explaining wave function. Uh, when, when you are what? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, the, when you are talking about the Laughlin wave function. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, there was some mention of the angular momentum on the slides, uh, which you didn't oh. talk about. So. Yes. So, uh, so I'll, okay. So, this is something that I did not want to talk about, but let me answer this. So, when Laughlin did his uh, calculation, what he did is to work in a symmetry gauge. Okay. So, which means that your magnetic field has both AX and AY. Okay. So, is that point clear? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, it has both AX and AY. So, if you look into this, uh, you solve the so, for example, if you solve the single particle uh, Hamiltonian, okay, gauge, you find that you can write the energy eigenstate in terms of some angular momentum time variable. Uh, sorry, angular momentum? Point. Okay, and then we introduce into interaction and so on. I see. Okay. Okay. So, if you want to read more about this, there is a very nice recent. Uh, a book by Steve Garvin and Kunian, which uh, discusses this point very clearly. Okay. But the uh, okay. thing to check is that, uh, uh, forget about the interaction part, uh, this is a very nice thing that you, uh, nice homework that you can do. Just take this two dimensional electron gas in a magnetic field, but try to solve this using a gauge. Okay. Then obviously, KY is not a good quantum number anymore. Right. Right. That uh, the angle theta in the two-dimensional space that becomes uh, uh, that becomes conserved. Okay, so you can level all your eigenstates by angular momentum. Okay. Okay. So, so and that's what Laughlin used actually. Okay. 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 Any other questions? Something is in the chat, so let me try to see those. Uh, okay. There is something on bulk quantization. Yeah, so let me try to see. I'm a bit confused about bulk quantization in QHC. Bulk is not contributing to the conductance. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you see the... Uh, Okay, so here is the thing. So the question really is that if since uh, the quantum is does the quantum Hall effect bulk calculate uh, contribute to the conductance? And uh, the thing is, uh, this has been a debate for quite some time. You know, in the early days of quantum Hall effect, is it really the bulk of the age? And if you talk to people like Jain, who, still, who kind of still believes that bulk is everything and age is not so much important. But however, people later did uh, mapping of the electric current profile in the uh, quantized Hall conductance regime, I mean, in the quantized Hall regime. And they wanted to see if the potential drop is more towards the age and the bulk. So from those kind of experiments, it is probably now proven that uh, the it's really the age states which carry the current. Okay, the bulk doesn't carry the current. 
the conductance is only due to age, and those age states are what the uh, current is carried on. However, because of this bulk age correspondence, you can also find out the conductance at the. Uh, you can also find out the conductance using a bulk picture. Okay, uh, so theoretically, you can think of this to be uh, a conductance is there either due to bulk or due to age. But in practice, it is always carried by the age series. Okay, so the next is, could you provide the presentation files? Well, uh, should it, do I need to do this or is there a recording which is going to come up? And yeah, so what we are planning is that we are recording all these lectures. Yeah. So I have already prepared, started preparing the YouTube link of the first lecture. Okay. I mean, just give me some time in a day or two or two, three days after next week, I'll send you the link. So each of these lectures will be uploaded in the YouTube. I had yeah. a YouTube channel. So whether you want to share the files separately, it's up to you. I mean, there is no, no I can share the files. There is no problem with that. It's just that um, it would be helpful if I can do this maybe a one or two lectures later. Oh, okay. so I can now share the first lecture file. Okay. And I can send it to all the registered participants. Okay. So I'll send it to you then? Yes, please send it to me. Okay. Sure. And please send it a PDF version. Yeah, I'll do the PDF thing. Sure. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah. Uh, the last calculation you showed, like uh, the supplementary part. So you can go uh, back. Just hold on one second. Let me just go back to this last calculation. So uh, you were saying that uh, the very phase one? Uh, the, yeah, the last one. So okay, so let me bring this up. So in this okay. Uh, when we okay, sorry, somehow this. Okay, let me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so uh, when you are writing the Berry connection, so yeah. it's a factor 1 by 2 because of the wave function. It's 1 by root 2, 1 by root 2. Sorry, uh, can, you, can you be a little louder? I can't hear you. Okay, so I am, I am saying that when you are writing the Berry connection in this uh, calculation, so yeah. the factor 1 by 2 because of the 1 by root 2 in front of the wave function. So did you take care of this while writing the final expression 2 pi? Yeah, uh, that's true actually. So you see the point is that uh, I haven't been very careful in taking care of the factors. So yeah. I'm going to get a factor of half probably everywhere. I work because I was thinking it should be pi. So that's why uh, no, it don't. Uh, it is probably not going to be pi. Uh, let me check again then. It's going to be okay. Let me check this and get back to you. I haven't been very careful about uh, this thing. Okay. Okay. Sir. okay. One more question, sir, regarding the disorder. So, like, uh, suppose my sample. So, is this audible, sir? Can you be a bit louder, please? Okay. Let me say this. Now it's uh, louder. Now, now it's louder. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, like I am saying. So suppose my sample is in such way in, is like uh, ultra clean. So it's not uh, kind of like breaking that. It's like translational in where like translational symmetry isn't uh, like oh, what I say. I need to put this in words. So the sample is translation invariant. So mm -hmm. it is gonna to show the quantum Hall effect in that uh, case. Sample is translation invariant. Yeah, it will show quantum on the picture. So, uh, like uh, this, like so, ultra clean sample to disorder. So, even yeah. time when you are like applying this uh, magnetic field to the system, it will show the quantum Hall effect. Yes. Okay. So the point is that the disorder cannot be too large. It should be such that the Hall plateaus, uh, sorry, the plateaus, uh, the levels do not merge with each other. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. If not, maybe uh, we can meet next Tuesday, I guess, at 5.30. Right? Uh, sorry, 3.30, right? Yes. 3.30 next Tuesday. Okay. Great. Okay. okay. Nice Thank you, Krishnandu. So, all of us, uh, we will meet on Tuesday. Stay safe. Okay. So you are ending the meeting. Yeah.